Well, there's so much to knowing who your prospect is. I mean, I would say, and, and the same would be true of writers, is that people write as if it's about something external that happens. And so they just tell us externally, or they'll, they'll show somebody making, a, changing their mind about something, but we have no idea why they changed their mind. We have no idea what it was that caused that change or how that change took place. So it goes from, I would never do that to, oh, now I see the light, I'm gonna do it, but we don't know how their internal logic shifted to make that be that's what they were gonna do, the meaning that they were reading in. And I think that is the biggest mistake people make, not to let us see that, and I, I kind of call it that internal struggle, you know, that place where, um, that place where suddenly they have the aha moment. Hey everybody, I'm Ken Newhouse, and I'm gonna welcome you to the Get Clients Now podcast, the show where high growth consultants and professionals come to access the newest and most effective methods and systems for online marketing, advanced sales and persuasive communication strategies, and automated marketing funnels. And if you're wondering if the Get Clients Now podcast can help you get more high value clients, enjoy more sales, build a massive tribe, and make more money, you're absolutely going to love this show. New House's work completely blows everything else that we've ever done with Google out of the water. I have been looking for a way to grow my presence online, and what I've viewed from Newhouse's work was something that certainly is faster than anything I've seen before. He says he's going to do something and he does it. He does it in the time frame that he says he's going to do it in. It's exciting when you talk about the results that you're going to get, and you can believe his word because he follows it up with action. The Newhouse is direct, he's to the point, he tells you what's on his mind, and he backs his words up. From what I know now, from working with him, he's passionate about his work and he backs it up 100%. What I like best is you offer something that no one else has out there, which is a pretty comprehensive approach about marketing a system. If somebody asks me should they use the Newhouse's team, absolutely, because you're going to get the important information that you need very, very quickly. Um, on the internet, on the different marketing techniques, I've never experienced anything like this. I would definitely recommend Ken Newhouse for someone who's serious about growing their business. I think that your results based on the numbers would at least double the sales in a very short time frame. Hey everybody, Ken Newhouse here from KenNewhouse.com and I want to welcome you back to the Get Clients Now podcast, where the one-size-fits-all marketing model is dumb, the client-centric business model is king, and leading experts share strategies and methods that you can use to accelerate brand acceptance, skyrocket your significance in the marketplace, and elevate your status so you can build your tribe with certainty. Today is episode number 350 of the Get Clients Now podcast. And on today's episode, I'm speaking with best-selling author Lisa Cron in the second part of the two-part interview that I recently did with her. And on today's episode, you're going to learn how after cracking the brain science code for persuasion, Lisa created a powerful storytelling framework that you can use to create irresistible intrigue and intense desire for the things you sell in the marketplace. Everybody knows that when you can create intrigue and desire for your products and services, you're gonna attract more clients, sell more stuff, and make a lot more money, which if you're like me and if you're like my most successful clients, is exactly what you're looking for, especially during the heart of this coronavirus shutdown. Now, before we actually dive back into part two of the interview with Lisa Cron on today's episode, I'm gonna continue with the test that I've been running over the last several weeks, which if you remember, this is where I've been reading through questions that you guys have been emailing me, and then I actually picked the best one, the one that I feel is the most relevant and it's gonna be the most helpful to all of the members of the Get Clients Now Nation. So the question I actually chose for today's show was submitted by Steve Cartwright, and Steve actually runs a digital engineering consulting service. And here's Steve's question. He says, I'm having an incredibly difficult time selling my consulting services right now. I'm actually getting more traffic and more opt-ins now than I was two months ago, but my conversions, and he's talking about sales conversions here, but my conversions have dropped by 41%. That's an average across the board of everything I sell, including my low-end information products. Is there anything you can recommend that'll help me increase my sales during the COVID-19 crisis? Before this shelter in place, and he's actually put that in quotes, before this shelter in place thing started, I was doing a lot of my consultations, presentations, and work with my clients on video calls so the fact that I can't get to a prospect or client's place of business isn't necessarily the issue. Most of the businesses that I work with are still up and running to a degree, but they're simply not spending money like they were before this thing started. Is there a strategy or method or tactic that your clients are using that's helping them to keep their sales somewhat steady right now? So Steve, first of all, thanks for submitting your question. Certainly thanks to everyone else who submitted their questions as well. 
If I didn't answer your question, I'll get to it on another show perhaps. If not, I'll do my best to answer you via email and give you some help. The thing that I've noticed of all of the people that are actually doing okay right now, and there's not a lot of them, but of the ones that are doing okay right now, they seem to have one thing in common and that has to do with the offers and how they're creating their offers. And so what I wanna do is I wanna cover a 10 step checklist, an offer creation checklist, if you will. And this is a checklist you can go through, compare your offers and how you create your offers for the things you're selling and see if you're meeting the criteria on this checklist. This could help you immensely. It may not help you at all, I don't know, but it's about the only thing I can see that's a common link between the people that are actually doing okay at this particular time. They're actually holding steady. A couple of them are actually selling a little bit more than they were before this whole thing started. But having said that, the one commonality that I'm seeing between these people is that their offers are created using a particular formula, a template, if you will. And so that's what I want to give you today. I want to actually run through this checklist with you fairly quickly. Don't worry about writing the things down that are on this checklist because I'm going to provide a PDF download of the list. But I want to actually fly through this list fairly quickly if I can because the interview I did with Lisa, the second half of that interview, she actually really over-delivered. She actually really over-delivered through the whole interview. But having said that, in the second half of the interview, and that's what we're gonna cover on today's episode, she really knocked it out of the park. She actually revealed several killer, absolutely amazing strategies I know you're gonna absolutely love. And if you're like me, there's gonna be several of these strategies that you had no idea existed before. I know I didn't know they existed before, and I'm actually ready to start to implement and use them. So let's go ahead and dive back into that 10-step checklist, and then you can actually use that to gauge the effectiveness of your offers and see if this actually can help you. Maybe it will. Maybe it'll make a dramatic difference for you. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But it's like I said, it's the one thing that I found in common for all the people that I have that are actually doing okay at this particular moment during this COVID-19 crisis. And as I just mentioned, there's going to be a PDF download of this in the show notes for this particular episode. So when you go to kennewhouse.com, Go to podcast episode number 350. It's the second episode with Lisa Cron. You will find a link where you can download the PDF of this 10-step checklist without an email address. I don't need your email address. I want to help you. And I think based on what I've seen, there's a really good chance this can help you not only now, but moving forward. Now, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by telling you that this 10-step checklist is going to increase your sales right now. I don't know that, right? And while there's a pretty good chance that it will... What you want to do is test it for yourself. So my best recommendation is that you listen as we go through this 10-step checklist, download the PDF of the checklist so you can go through it and use that as a template to compare your offers and how you create your offers, which will help you determine if this can work for you. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, how important are your offers? Meaning how important is the way that you structure and word your offer to your overall sales? Well, we know that your sales copy is critically important. We know that targeting the right market and using the right media is also absolutely critical to your success. But what about the offer? Well, unfortunately, most of the so-called marketing gurus online today are giving far too little emphasis on the importance and construction of the offer. Yet without question, it is every bit as important as your ads. It's every bit as important as the pitch you're making in the marketing campaigns and in your presentations. And here's why I say that. A really good offer a really, really good offer can easily double, if not triple, your response rates. On the other hand, a bad or botched offer can easily kill your ads, your marketing campaigns. It could even kill a presentation that you're doing, a presentation that was going wonderfully, a presentation that would otherwise have been successful. It would have been profitable. So what exactly is the offer? Well, quite simply, it's the deal that you make with your prospect, make with your client, and the terms of that deal. The offer is what she gets for what she gives you. It includes, number one, the product or service. It includes all the promises you make about the product or service. It includes the guarantee, and the offer also includes the transactional details, such as how your prospect or client can buy your product or service. So let me give you an example with that. They can buy on your website. They could hit your landing page. Maybe they could buy via direct mail, although I know a lot of people aren't selling via direct mail these days. Some of us still are. So there are multiple different forms of media they could use to make the purchase, and you have to include the transactional details in each one of those media. Listen, all of these details are important and all of them, listen, all of them should be spelled out at the end of your ad, on your website or landing page, in your sales letter, whatever you're using, you've got to spell this stuff out. These details should also be clearly spelled out in the order device. Okay, Ken, so what's an order device? I know some of you guys are probably asking that question right now. Well, the order device is the place on your website, on your order form, whatever, 
where the client or prospect is going to provide the information necessary, their information, to complete the transaction. This is typically something like your checkout page, could be an order form that accompanies a sales letter, whatever. And one of the primary mistakes I see people make is that they fail to spell out the details properly, fully, and completely in the places that I just mentioned, which in virtually every instance, listen to me very carefully, which in virtually every instance is going to be a very, very costly mistake. And so now that I've gotten you up to this point and for maximum effectiveness, let's go ahead and take a look at the 10-step checklist that you want to filter all of your offers for. So when you create your offers, you want to filter them through this 10-step checklist. So if you're ready, let's go ahead and roll with this. Number one. Is your offer specific? Meaning will the prospect understand exactly what they get and how they get it? Number two, is your offer exclusive? Are you making your offer only to a select few and then making them feel like they are an exclusive group, an exclusive bunch of folks? Or are you making your offer to everyone, like a broad brush offer that doesn't contain any specificity? Number three, is your offer valuable? Will your prospects perceive your offer to be of value to them? Listen, your offer could be inexpensive for you to make, but it must have a high perceived value to your potential clients, to your potential prospects, because if not, why would they want it? Number four, is your offer unique? Is the deal you're offering only available through your business? So your offer can be exclusive, but useless. Your offer can also be unique and useless, right? So make sure your offer helps your prospects save time, save money, do their jobs better, attract new business, make more sales, or something else that's just as helpful. Number six, is your offer relevant? Do your prospects want what you're offering? Just because you think it's relevant is irrelevant and no pun intended. Do your prospects, does the marketplace believe that it's relevant? Do they want it? Number seven, is your offer plausible? You know, we see so many offers online today that are simply just too good to be true. And then we see other offers that are just plain stupid. They're silly. But either way, your offer needs to be credible, right? It needs to be believable. Number eight, is your offer easy to acquire? You know, the harder you make it for your prospects to obtain your offer, the lower your response rates are going to be. So make your order forms clear and simple. Make your checkout pages simple, clear, short, and concise. And make sure that you add your terms and conditions of the purchase, like the guarantees, how to make returns, things like that. Be concise and make that information very, very easy to find. Number nine, is your offer urgent? Are you clear about the deadline of your offer? Is it an early bird special or are you, uh, as an example, limiting it to the first 50 people who respond? You know, I've got an early bird list that we're creating for Social Proof Profits where I'm going to teach you the different types of storymonials you can create and the exact scenarios you want to deploy them in. And we'll do that by teaching you the five levels of market awareness and sophistication, as well as the storyline framework, which you're going to use for creating the most powerful and effective storymonials you can imagine. Well, that's great, Ken. So what's the storyline framework? Well, the storyline framework teaches you how to identify your best clients, customers, or patients for the purposes of creating storymonials. Also teaches you how to target the perfect candidates and the process for getting them to participate and help you, which has to be followed perfectly, or chances are pretty good that you're going to screw the whole thing up. And you're also going to learn how to edit storymonials for maximum impact. And then lastly, I'm going to walk you through the framework for distribution, which results in what we call search engine social proof saturation. Try saying that three times fast, but search engine social proof saturation is a phenomenon that's akin to having a professional sales force working for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so that once you've actually deployed your storymonials, you've created a high level array of clients, customers, or patients that literally do the selling for you. And while I won't go into all of it now, I'll tell you that one of the benefits of using storymonials is having prospects ready to sign up, ready to pay you before they ever even hear your sales presentation, which is awesome. And I literally have to limit the number of people that can attend this training to 50 people because I'm going to give one-on-one help for every single person in the class. So if you decide to take the class, I've got to keep it small because of the fact that I want to be able to respond to your questions and I want to be able to help you immediately and give you the attention that you deserve. So you've got to, in many instances, limit the number of people who can respond to a particular offer. Number 10. Does your offer have a guarantee? In this climate we live in today, you better be offering a guarantee if at all possible. And one of the best ways you can strengthen your offer is with a money back guarantee. You know, if you're selling digital stuff online, one of the things you can do to really strengthen your offer is you can allow the person who buys your stuff, if they decide to return what you have, right, the primary product, you can allow them to keep all of the bonuses that you offered with the purchase. Having a well-constructed offer, meaning having an offer that meets each of the 10 criteria on the checklist that I just mentioned, in all likelihood, is going to make a big, big difference in your sales and your ability to get clients and generate revenue for your business. And like I said before, 
I'm not going to insult your intelligence and promise that using this strategy is going to help increase your sales. But certainly, I believe it's worth testing. You know, testing is free. It's absolutely free to compare this 10-step checklist with the offers that you're currently using. So my recommendation for you, Steve, and for everyone listening, is that you compare your offers with this checklist and see. Take a look and see if you're executing all 10 of these steps. You may be doing this already. My guess is that you're not. My guess is that you're missing a couple of these, if not a lot of them. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the opening monologue. And with that, let's go ahead and welcome our guest, Lisa Cron, back in on the show. And remember, on today's show, she's going to reveal how she cracked the brain science code and then in turn, how she created a powerful storytelling framework that you can use to create irresistible intrigue and intense desire in the marketplace for the things you sell. All right, let's roll. They pulled it, I think they pulled it down. Uh, it got a lot of, social media did not like it. Um, it did not do well at all. But I think that's a commercial that really, really doesn't work because, and because it sounds defensive. It sounds like they're arguing against somebody who's already told you not to do something. And so when you're pulled into it, you're thinking, instead of thinking, well, yeah, okay, good, good. She's giving me permission to, to you know, drink Diet Coke. You're thinking, maybe there's some reason why I shouldn't. Because why is she sounding that way? The fact that she's also stick thin. And you think, why does she even need to drink a Diet Coke? So that would be one that absolutely doesn't work. Um, there's another one that doesn't work that was that was that was literally pulled down right when when the when when social media was first taking off. It was a um, a Motrin commercial. Um, just it was just graphics. And basically, it implied it was when women started to wear babies in uh, in slings and in backpacks, and it implied and it was about back aches, like you know because. Granted, if you have a baby in a sling or a backpack, it might, you know, hurt your back. <laughs> but, but the ad went on to say that the reason that women were wearing babies that way was because it was a fashion statement, because it made them feel like a real mom. <laughs> it was like immediately pulled back. I mean, it was really one of those ads where you think, okay, the person who wrote this was definitely not a mom with a baby in a sling. So, I mean, social media, it's funny when you go back and read the articles about it at the time, because social media was so new that it took so little to pull it down because that's all there was. Um, but those would be two where they really did not know their audience. They really, one sounded defensive, one just clearly didn't know. And, you know, I was reading some of the tweets that went through and one was, <laughs> one woman had tweeted, you know, this is so offensive that even my husband hated it and thought what's wrong with them. It, it was just, you know, definitely um, did not. Arrogant, condescending, out of touch, uh, superficial. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But it was like they were, they were looking at what they thought and they just. Yeah, they don't, they don't value their audience enough to do the research. Right. And I think that that's, that's really the, I mean, again, to do the research, but also I think even when you do the research, you still have to step out of the notion that the way that you see it, it is. And that is really hard, not because, you know, we're jerks or stubborn or, 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 or purposely arrogant, but because it's, it's like that old David Foster Wallace, do you know the, he did this really wonderful thing. Um, it's a, it was a commencement speech and there's a, a really wonderful, like shortened nine minute video on it called This is Water. Do you know that one? Uh, off the top of my head, no. It's really brilliant. But it starts with this, it's a, you know, I guess an old joke of like two young fish are swimming around and an older fish comes up and says, you know, hey guys, how's the water? And they just look and then the fish swims away and one fish turns to the other and goes, what's water? And we don't realize that the way that we see the world is the water that we're swimming in, as opposed to the way things really are. Our water is what we've been wired to see, and the meaning that we've been wired to read into things, the meaning that we write into things comes from us. It isn't in that thing itself. Right. NLP, the map is not the territory, it's the map, it's what we perceive of our environment. It's not the reality of the environment. It's our interpretation of the experiences we've had within that. That's, that's basic. I mean, well, that's high level copywriting stuff, but I guess that's pretty relevant to story as well. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, because that's what you need to know about your 
every character you've got. Like, why are they doing what they're doing? And it always goes much deeper than what it looks like on the surface. Okay. Can I put you on the spot here? And if you can do this, great. I would love it. And if you can't do it or we don't have enough time, that's great as well. Can you give me, give us an example of in a sales setting and you could sell, I don't care what it is, a car. I mean, not a car. I don't, we don't deal with car dealers here or car salesmen. That's a bad example. Uh, whatever, just, just a basic sales situation, maybe selling a piece of artwork where someone does it the wrong way. And then how would it be done the right way? And you can make this as overly simplistic as you want to kind of illuminate this in a business setting. So we can see this in our mind's eye, if that makes sense. The easiest way for me to do that, even if you were a writer, you said come up with a story this way or that way without giving me the the parameters of what it was, that would be difficult. But what I can do um, is take one or two, one, the first one is a very simple one comes to mind, commercials. And okay. One that does work and one that doesn't work. Perfect. That works. Okay. So which do you want first? The one that does or the one that doesn't? <laughs> Let's do the one that does not work first. Okay. I will, and I'll tell you the story about this one. Okay. I, uh, like you, I mean, I don't watch much TV and I admit to not watching commercials in their like actual habitat, you know, um, uh, environment, meaning, you know, during some sort of show. But I was, I was in a movie theater and I was watching a movie and before the movie started, this commercial came on and it made me so angry, I was st- screaming at the screen. And later on, I was talking to a business group in, in Austin, Texas, who asked sort of a similar question that you did. And I said, well, I don't, what I just said, I don't watch much and I, but I did see this. I talked about this commercial and everybody went, and one guy in particular went, oh my God, yes, I had that exact, my wife walked out, she was so angry. Um, because it really is um, deeply, uh, it just doesn't work. And it's, it's a commercial for Diet Coke. So do you want me just to play the audio of it right now? Sure, if you want to, yeah. Okay, so I can totally do that. Let me be sure this is as loud as it gets. And you might have seen this one. So um, let's see, is it going to start at the beginning? Look, here's the thing about Diet Coke. It's delicious. It makes me feel good. Life is short. If you want to live in a yurt, yurt it up. If you want to run a marathon, I mean, that sounds super hard, but okay. I mean, just do you, whatever that is. And if you're in the mood for a Diet Coke, have a Diet Coke. Diet Coke. Because I can. Okay. And that's the commercial. People get paid to write that? That's the commercial. The problem with it is, is she sounds utterly defensive from the get-go. It's like she's arguing with someone who's told her, you shouldn't drink Diet Coke. It's really bad for you. So she's saying, yeah, because I can, because it's delicious. If you want to, you can drink it. So already we're thinking, why is she so defensive? Who is she arguing with? And then when she says, if you want to live in a yurt, yurt it up. And you're thinking, is somebody say something bad about yurts too? (laughs) Like, Is there some anti-yurt movement? And then she goes into the, and if you want to run a marathon, I mean, that sounds super hard, but go ahead. Again, not only does she sound defensive, but she sounds like she's about to say how hard math is at that at that point. And then when she says, you know, just be whoever, so I don't think it's even, it's, it's just do you. You know, like something you should probably do with the shades down behind closed doors. Like, what does she even mean? Again, it sounds like she's giving you permission to do something that someone has told you not to do. They pulled it, I think they pulled it down. Uh, It got a lot of, social media did not like it. Um, It did not do well at all. But I think that's a commercial that really, really doesn't work because, and because it sounds defensive. It sounds like they're arguing against somebody who's already told you not to do something. And so when you're pulled into it, you're thinking, instead of thinking, well, yeah, okay, good, good. She's giving me permission to, to you know, drink Diet Coke. You're thinking, maybe there's some reason why I shouldn't. Because why is she sounding that way? The fact that she's also stick thin and you think, why does she even need to drink a Diet Coke? So that would be one that absolutely doesn't work. Um, there's another one that doesn't work that was that was that was literally pulled down right when when the when when social media was first taking off. It was a um, a Motrin commercial. Uh, 
just it was just graphics. <laughs> Basically, it implied it was when women started to wear babies in uh, in slings and in backpacks, and it implied and it was about backaches, like you know, because granted, if you have a baby in a sling or a backpack, it might you know hurt your back. <laughs> but but the ad went on to say that the reason that women were wearing babies that way was because it was a fashion statement because it made them feel like a real mom. <laughs> It was like immediately pulled back. I mean, it was really one of those ads where you think, okay, the person who wrote this was definitely not a mom with a baby in a sling. So, I mean, social media, it's funny when you go back and read the articles about it at the time, because social media was so new that it took so little to pull it down because that's all there was. Um, but those would be two where they really did not know their audience. They really, one sounded defensive, one just clearly didn't know. And, you know, I was reading some of the tweets that went through and one was, <laughs> one woman had tweeted, you know, this is so offensive that even my husband hated it and thought what's wrong with them. It, it was just, you know, definitely um, did not. Arrogant, condescending, out of touch, uh, superficial. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But it was like they were they were looking at what they thought, and they just yeah they don't they don't value their audience enough to do the research. Right, and I think that that's that's really the. I mean, again, to do the research, but also I think even when you do the research, you still have to step out of the notion that the way that you see it is what it is, and that is really hard not because you know we're jerks or stubborn or 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 or, or purposely arrogant but because it's it's like that old david foster wallace do you know the he did this really wonderful thing um it's a it was a commencement speech and there's a, a really wonderful like shortened nine minute video on it called this is water do you know that one uh off the top of my head no it's really brilliant but it starts with this it's a you know, I guess an old joke of like two young fish are swimming around and an older fish comes up and says, you know, hey guys, how's the water? And they just look and then the fish swims away and one fish turns to the other and goes, what's water? And we don't realize that the way that we see the world is the water that we're swimming in as opposed to the way things really are. Our water is what we've been wired to see and the meaning that we've been wired to read into things, the meaning that we write into things comes from us. It isn't in that thing itself. Right. NLP, the map is not the territory. It's the map. It's what we perceive of our environment. It's not the reality of the environment. It's our interpretation of the experiences we've had within that. That's that's basic. I mean, well, that's high level copywriting stuff, but I guess that's pretty relevant to story as well. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, because that's what you need to know about your, every character you've got, like, why are they doing what they're doing? And it always goes much deeper than what it looks like on the surface. So, um, and then it's easier to talk about, uh, there was an ad that did work um, and it was a very simple ad and it was um, it was for Subaru and um, you may have seen it. It was, it has just a couple of lines in it and it opens and it breaks the rules for car commercials because for car commercials, you're kind of not supposed to see a squished up car. <laughs> like, like what happened to you? You're not supposed to see that Jeep after, you know, after impact. And it's, you know, it's like, it's very early morning and the camera's moving in and you see it's like, there's a kind of a freeway thing here. And there's a, a truck that's going to take this, you know, squished up car away. And there's, you know, one cop is standing next to, I think another one or the tow truck driver. I can't remember which character comes up and it's like looking at this car with this look of, you know, oh, you know, boy, that was bad news. And the, you know, the guy who'd been there for a while turns to him and says, and this is all he says is they survived. And you see the look on this guy's face, you know, looking at the car. And then the tow truck driver, I forget, it's repeated three times. He says it. I know the commercial. Yeah, exactly. And the, It's implying that, you know, this these are safe. I mean, these are safe cars. You want to keep your family safe, your kids safe. All the way through. All the way. It, and that's all it takes. And then it, the commercial ends with. You know, you're, you're watching this family of four come out. There's a new Subaru there. And the dad turns to the camera and says, we survived. And that's all it took. Because what they knew about their audience is that, which, is, which on one level is all of us, is that we all want to believe that if we get into a car accident where our car is squished, 
you know, what our misbelief, which we're hoping it's a misbelief, is that, okay, if that happens to you, you're a goner. Like, that is pretty much it, very black and white. And what that was fighting against was that, you know what, if you have this kind of car, you might not be a goner. You might be okay, because that's what this kind of car, that's their, you know, their, their first and foremost goal is to keep you safe. And it was really meaningful. And they, 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 um, they showed that because each time the person turned to the other one and said they survived, the look of like surprise and awe and almost reverence at that, you know, at that, at that, you know, disbelief. Of, what do you mean they survived? That that is so. I mean, it also it also just tapped into our humanity the way we want other people to survive. I mean, they were feeling you know good about people that they didn't even know. But it, it just it conveyed so much. It was really, it got to me. I mean, you know, you watch a lot of these. Come, let me tell you something. When you say about, well, you don't have to be a novelist or a writer to do this. I have to be honest. When I was writing this book and I was watching commercial after commercial after commercial, they were better storytellers than most novelists. I was sobbing most of the time. I mean, it's hard to watch them and not have you have commercials. You can watch them over and over and you're still like, you know, tearing up that, that extra gum commercial, you know, where the guy proposes with the gum wrapper. That's a great one. Yeah. I cry every time. It's like, it's not like you don't know what's going to happen. It doesn't matter. I, every time in my head, I'm going, okay, I'm not going to tear up. I'm not going to tear up. And then I do because it, well, this, this goes to, this goes back to your point again, these principles are built into our DNA. And so guys, think about this, a commercial, what's a commercial? 20, 30, 40 seconds long, maybe a minute in some instances, uh, short of a minute, a whole story is told, massive persuasion takes place, massive levels of emotion are triggered, all kinds of neurotransmitters are being released in your body, that's just big chaotic mess is going on. And look at the window of time and even the, the minimal use of verbiage. I mean, they use obviously, word pictures. I mean, they're using like images, which you can paint images through using words in your stories, but you don't have to, these principles will work whether you're writing a book, a novel, or you're telling somebody a two minute story about how they're going to benefit and how other people have benefited from buying your product. Again, I, I see the connection. I hopefully you see it as well, but I see again, this is one of the reasons why I love social proof selling and video testimonials in my mind as long as they're genuine, not the not the real schmaltzy stuff you see on some of the infomercials, but like genuine people that aren't, you know, paid actors, like real people who've had real transformation take place in their life or their business, whatever, those things work and it works for all the reasons you're saying. And again, you know, when I first did my, just real quick, I'll tell you this story. When I first did my first, this is what saved my business after I got hit by the dump truck, mean old Dan Kennedy, I took I borrowed some money from uh, Joe the German, who I say that lovingly. He, he's a man who came here from Birch's Garden, Germany, with a hundred dollar bill in his pocket, with an eighth grade education. He was in, he lived in Birch's Garden, Germany, where Adolf Hitler lived. His father had like one of the high end barber shops in town. Adolf Hitler used to come in there with the SS. They would clear out the shop. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't call and say, "Hey, how much to get a haircut?" He just showed up. Cleared out the shop with the German shepherds, the bomb dogs, his father. He said his father was terrified that he would cut his hair wrong. Okay. So he was forced to cut his hair, like didn't ask. They would just show up. And so he said he was terrified. Well, anyway, Germany was losing the war. So Joe at 10 years old, Joe's again now deceased, but 10 years old, they put a gun, the, the German military inducted him into the army and put a rifle in his hand put him on a post overlooking a, a road and said, shoot anything that comes down the road. Well, the first American soldiers he saw on tanks, he said he got so scared, he threw the gun down and ran. He deserted. Well, at 10 years old, what are they going to do? So he comes to America. He knew how to cut hair. He comes to America with a hundred dollar bill in his pocket at 17 or 18. He got a job working for Max Factor Jr. in Los Angeles. Everybody knows who Max Factor is. That really helped him. He did Marilyn Monroe's hair. He did Jane Mansfield's hair. He was really, really good at what he did. He moved to the Midwest. By the time he's 25, he's a multimillionaire. He moves to the Midwest, starts his own salon, builds this big salon up. But it was Joe that actually gave me the money after I literally went bankrupt after the dump truck. I had bought a brand new house. I had seven bathrooms in a house. Can you imagine? It's a huge house, five bedrooms, seven bathrooms for a 27-year-old kid. In-ground pool, 
two clinics. I get hit by the dump truck. I lose everything. He gives me the money. I ended up uh, really helped us out. Go to Dan Kennedy. Dan says, you need video testimonials. I'm like, well, all of my patients from this practice where I just lost them, I never really got a chance to get started, but I had patients from the other practices that I had. So I had a big event, had all these people at my practice, had it catered the whole nine yards, but I had a 92 minute long VHS video of my testimonials, like 32 people, 33 people on it. Very long, five, six minutes, four minute testimonials. 10, 15 seconds is all you need. So there's been a big difference that I've learned. So you talk about telling a story, a testimonial on video can tell a story in 10 seconds and have a huge impact. So again, guys, buy these books, invest in them. These again are not books that you're going to read one time and oh, that's a great story. No, these are like manuals for your success. And so when she talks about writing a novel, just tweak it like I did in your mind and say, okay, to be an effective storyteller, because these principles are universal and they're still going to work. And you're the first person who's actually broken it down and made it so we can actually understand how the process works and do this. But aside from not knowing our audience, Lisa, in your estimation, what do you think the biggest mistake is people when they're doing that, when they're telling stories, what's the biggest mistake aside from not knowing their prospects What's the biggest story we're making, well, biggest mistake we're making in the process of telling stories? Well, there's so much to knowing who your prospect is. I mean, I would say, and, and the same would be true of writers, is that people write as if it's about something external that happens. And so they just tell us externally, or they'll, they'll show somebody making, a, changing their mind about something, but we have no idea why they changed their mind. We have no idea what it was that caused that change or how that change took place. So it goes from, I would never do that to, oh, now I see the light, I'm going to do it, but we don't know how their internal logic shifted to make that be that's what they were going to do, the meaning that they were reading in. And I think that is the biggest mistake people make, not to let us see that. And I, I kind of call it that internal struggle, you know, that place where um, that place where suddenly they have the aha moment. I mean, that would be the biggest mistake, or they'll, they'll write people having an aha moment, but we don't know how they got there. I mean, it would be like if you really wanted to try to figure out how to, you know, pick a lock and you watch someone do something, go, oh, aha, I got it. And they did it. And you're going, OK, but well, what did you do? <laughs> how do I do that? Like, what is that exactly? And they gave you no insight into what it was they realized that allowed them to do it, because that's what we come for. We don't come for external things. We come for the internal reason as to why somebody now is willing to take a risk that they wouldn't take before. We come for that internal reason as to why this thing that you're asking me to do that makes me think my tribe is going to shun me if I do it. You need to show me why not only aren't they going to shun me, but now they're going to turn around and say, wow, that was really brave of you to do that. I mean, that's, it's like, let me give you a, a very quick example. There was, um, I happen to love the tagline, because so many of us love the tagline, the, you know, um, the, the Motel 6 one, you know, we'll leave the light on for you. Yeah. And so um, I was reading, there's a really great, I forget where it was, but there's a, a, um, a an article out there where the guy who, I think it was the, the head of the advertising agency that that put that together at the end of the day, trying to figure it out before they got Tom Baudet, whose voice is just so fabulous. So they had these focus groups and they had focus groups and they knew that every single person in the focus group had within the past six months had gone to a Motel 6, right? So every single person there had been to a Motel 6. So they had this focus group and they said, so like what motel would you go to? Where would you stay when you're on the road? And like nobody mentions Motel 6, like not one person. So they're kind of thinking, okay, what should we do? Like, are we doing something wrong? And so they went back and they asked again, kind of rephrased it. And again, no person said I would go to a Motel 6. And finally they're going, okay, we need to really, we think we'll ask one more time. Everybody's getting tired. We're spending all this money. That's the third time. Everybody's like on their way out. Still, nobody says Motel 6. And then finally, as they're about to leave, one person says, well, you know, if it's late and I'm on the road and there's nowhere else, I'll stay at a Motel 6 because then I can save enough money on gas to bring my grandkid a stuffed animal. And at that moment, everybody else came up with a similar story, stopped 
they came back. They said, yeah, me too. Yeah, it allows me to do that. Yeah, it makes me feel. And what happened was they flipped from feeling like, oh my God, I'm going to look like a cheapskate. <laughs> if I admit that I go to Motel 6, they're going to think like I also dumpster dive. You know, it's not going to go over well with my tribe. But when someone finally, I guess they were exhausted and beaten down and maybe felt like, okay, I've got to say something because this is true, as opposed to them, everybody else thinking, you know, which they could have, oh, that's the dumpster diver and we would never do that. Instead, that person came across as somebody who was really courageous, right? They're brave. They were willing to be, and this is the key thing in any story, willing to be vulnerable, to really open up and admit to something that they knew other people might look down on them for. And what tends to happen when we're willing to do that is other people turn around and don't go, that's the idiot. They go, me too. I feel that way too. That is me too. So, I mean, that's sort of the point of all of it is coming through and making them see that that thing that's holding them back is actually something that not only makes you your more authentic self, but that other people are probably going to go, yeah, that was the smart person who said that. And that that's what makes you a leader. Because the reason that people aren't willing to make those changes or even aren't willing to tell you what they really think is in focus groups, you know, good luck for getting somebody to really tell you what they think. Exactly. Is that they don't want to be vulnerable. We're terrified in the time we're tiny of saying what we really think and what we feel. What we want to say is what we think our tribe is going to, you know, is going to like. So it's breaking that down as much as possible. And that's what stories do because we're watching someone and we're thinking maybe, oh my gosh, they're going to do that. And the tribe's going to shun them. And then it flips around and they do it. And in fact, that's the very thing that, that, you know, that pulls them in and that we feel, oh my God, they could be brave and vulnerable at the same time. It's, you know, it's like that old, you know, you can't be, you can't be brave unless you're scared. People go, I'm fearless. It's like, well, that doesn't mean anything. You know, you can't be brave if you're fearless. You can't be courageous if you're fearless. That's one of the biggest reasons why people will not buy. They'll give you a different reason. That's one of the biggest reasons people won't buy is because they're afraid they're going to look like an idiot to their family, to their spouse, to someone else, or they can look at it and say, well, that's great for them, but it's not going to work for me. And so that's, I mean, these are underlying processes. You got time for a couple more questions? Okay. So based on what I read in your book, when you're telling an effective story, when you're doing this right, you can literally get someone to actually mentally, I don't want to say this incorrectly, but they kind of check out. They're often like fantasy land. They're like, it's like daydreaming in your car. You know, you're driving along, but you're not cognizant of the fact that you're driving along, you're living somewhere else in your mind at that moment. And when we tell an effective story, what is it as far as this is like a brain science question? What is it what's going on there when we can actually take somebody to that magical place like I talked about at the beginning of the show? What's going on in our brains to allow that to happen? Because if you understand what's happening, then we can actually reproduce it if we Oh, yeah. Learn how to do this right. I mean, it, it, it's basically sort of two things. One is literally, as I said earlier, they've done those fMRI studies that show that when you're lost in a story, the same areas of your brain light up that would light up if you were doing what that character is doing. You literally really are there. What, what it activates in our brain is both that and that notion of, I, I, I think I keep, I know I keep doing this, it's like, it's like a Vulcan mind melt. <laughs> we are on the same wavelength, but that means that that character has to have a wavelength. And the wavelength is how they're making sense of what's happening. If they're not, then we are just going to supply our own beliefs that are very surface as to why a person would be doing what they're doing. It's going to be surface. It's going to be generic. It's not going to get you anywhere. If we're not down there feeling what they're feeling, their motivation, the meaning they're reading into it, why it matters to them, it, it activates those neural pathways and literally... It then we are feeling it as if we're there and we have literally checked out. I mean, and they've done the research. The evolutionary biologists said that the reason why that happens, the reason why, I mean, biologically what's happened is first you get a hit of dopamine and dopamine is that neurotransmitter that, you know, that makes you cu curiosity is basically it. And it's not just pleasure. We used to think of it as a pleasure transmitter, but it's curiosity because we think we are going to get a reward at the end. But the two other things, the two other neurotransmitters that are become this they become this biological cocktail that really yeah 
you know, catapults us out of reality is the other one is cortisol. And cortisol, as we know, is when we're anxious. And we're anxious because we want to know what's going to happen. Is this person in danger? How are they going to get out of the situation that I know if I was in, I'd be terrified I would get ostracized or whatever bad would happen. And then the third chemical is oxytocin. And oxytocin is empathy. And empathy is we care. That's why even if you're telling a story about yourself, because it doesn't mean you can't tell stories about yourself, you just can't say how great you were or what you did. Is But if you are allowed to be yourself to be self-deprecating, you're putting yourself in a situation where you might be embarrassed or you might be mortified. And, and again, being embarrassed or mortified goes deeper than, than physical pain. Our memory of physical pain is far less imprinted than our, you know, they say, in fact, that the only memory where you really are there so much is when you remember something that mortified you. Like, think about it. You don't have to feel awful, but some motion, some moment where you are like so deeply embarrassed and your, your whole body goes into that same high alert. So those three chemicals end up pulling us in and they literally put the time out on reality. And evolutionary biologists believe the reason for that is because that's what allowed us to plan for the future, right? I mean, in the beginning, stories weren't about, you know, sit around the campfire and this will be an enjoyable, fun way to go into a world of make-believe and leave reality behind. Stories were ways to figure out, given what we know of the past and what things happened, if I find myself in this situation, this is what I need to do to survive. And so that's the whole point of story is figuring out how to survive and thrive in situations that we haven't quite been in yet. That's that's why we have story to begin with. We make such a big mistake to think that story, as I said before, is about something that's auxiliary or something that's just or make believe, meaning not real. It is it is literally how we make sense of every- everything. Yeah, everything. Okay, so this might be. I won't say it's the most important question, but for me personally, I think it's the most important question. But for everybody listening. This is probably the second most important question. We, you talked at length about knowing, having, having an intimate understanding of your target market, of your prospects, of the people you're trying to appeal to, whether it's to sell a book or to sell a product, a service, whatever it is, you got to know these people on a super intimate level. Here's my question. How do we learn this information, whether it's a tool, a company, a process, Lisa, how do we learn these intimate things, these little nuances, the backstory? How do we gather that research? I mean, I think if obviously if you don't have the money for a focus group, I think there's so many different things you can do. And so much of it these days is social media. I mean, so much of it these days is really trying to figure out, I mean, the first thing I think you want to do is what you said a while ago, which is, okay, who don't you want? <laughs> you really want to figure out, because the answer to who, who's your audience is never everyone. <laughs> it's yeah. never everyone. Never, it's never. Like, who is your audience? And then maybe even for this particular you know, campaign that you're going to do, what strata of that audience are you trying to reach? And then I think it really is kind of going down and doing the research, whether it's going online and finding other companies that do similar things that you do, seeing who follows them, seeing, you know, following them either on Instagram or on Twitter or on Facebook, seeing places that they comment, what do they actually say? You can dive into it that way. I think if it's an audience that is not, you know, particularly media savvy, like a, a much older group, it literally would be going and finding out where they congregate and then and then going there and really talking to people. But again, it's really hard to ask direct head on questions. I mean, you, you kind of have to, you know, because people aren't going to tell you inherently. This is skill. Yeah, you got to build trust. And you got to keep asking why. People will give you the easiest answer and the safest answer first. You got to keep asking why and you can't judge. There can't be any shaminess to anything. Everything has to be completely okay. But I think there's a lot of social media ways to do this now that there did not used to be in the past, obviously, at all. Um, but, but that would be my, I go to that in depth in my book, and that would be my, I mean, that would be my advice on that. And 
I'm, I'm assuming people probably already know a lot of that, but I think even following people and then seeing who they follow and then seeing what they post and seeing why, if there's a company similar to yours, um, how you're different from them, what you're offering. I mean, I know that's something that I did with, with what I write. I could see what every other you know, writing manual or writing instructors offered. And then I could completely see why what I was offering was different. And then I could completely see how that tapped in to what I knew that my audience was was looking for. Great answer. Yeah, that's a great answer. So just a couple things real quick. We've all seen like cuts, maybe it was from family vacation or whatever, where the kids kept saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? We all know that. Are we there yet? How much farther? Are we there yet? So you got me really excited about the third book. So you may have to block me because I'm going to be sending emails like almost every day. Is it done yet? Is it done yet? Is the book done yet? Is it done yet? I'm really looking forward to your book. But Lisa, what's the one question today that I should have asked you that I didn't? Oh, it's probably something I'll think of like in an hour from now. What would be the one question? Relevant to people using story in business to be like to build a, a more solid brand influence in the marketplace, to be more persuasive, to be more engaging, to be more effective at selling. What didn't I ask? The things that come to mind um, are, are two things. One is general and it really would have hit harder on emotion and why social intelligence is, the, is not a soft science and is absolutely the most important tool in your toolbox. Why facts really don't work at all. And, and, and really why we can't make a single decision. I, I love diving into that part anyway, if we can't feel emotion, because I think that that is what stops people um, from really diving in because they think of it as soft science because it makes them feel uncomfortable because we feel so much safer with something that seems very quantifiable. I think it's what's wrong with our, with our basic education system is that it judges people based on the kind of quote unquote intelligence, which is not intelligence, which is quantifiable. So if you know math or you know all of the capitals of all of the states in alphabetical order, so what? What difference does that make in any way, shape or form? It doesn't. It's, it's social intelligence, emotional intelligence, that really makes a difference. And then the other thing I would say that just sort of came to mind really has to do with sharpening and figuring out based on who your audience is, what point you have to make. And that point is what you would figure out based on what that misbelief is. And by misbelief, I would say is, what is it that your target audience believes that, that will keep them from doing what it is that you want them to do? What belief do you have to overcome? And then the other thing that we didn't talk about at all would be identifying the place where what you are offering them solves a problem that they already have. So it's going to tap into it. And then the third layer of that is how being able to tap into that and solving that problem will give them, for lack of a better way of putting it, more social cred, meaning they'll feel their mo most authentic self. Because we're all, this <laughs> we're so wired to need other people. We're all people who needs people. In fact, when you hear about lone wolf, people go, I'm a lone wolf. Do you know what a lone wolf actually is in the wolf community? A an outcast. Yeah, an outcast. A lone wolf is somebody who cannot work with other people and they're an outcast and they end up dying. <laughs> Nobody is really a lone wolf. We all got here because everybody worked together and made roads and made electricity. And, you know, I mean, none of us exist alone, but we all need to be part of a particular tribe. And I guess the last thing, and we did talk about this a bit, is really how important it is to respect those places where even when you know you're a thousand percent right if you start telling your audience the truth and let's imagine it is true you are 100 percent right it's the truth if you are stepping on a deeply held belief that they've got they're going to come back at you with a screed and you will have no way not only won't they believe what you're saying but you'll be locked out forever you gotta find a way in that is gonna, which doesn't mean you can't change. It doesn't mean that you can't show them that what they're doing might be wrong or not working or erroneous. 
but you got to find a way in that respects them. And I think that is the biggest thing. You got to respect your audience. You got to, even when they're, I'll tell you a story that I just heard. I've been, <laughs> because the world is so falling apart and I, I finally got in place where I don't want to listen to news anymore. If something bad is happening, I'll get an alert, you know, um, I'll get an email from some you know news source. So I've been trying to listen to podcasts that are like either you know, business or, 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 or calming. And I was listening to the one on Mr. Rogers, right? You can't get more calming than Mr. Rogers. So there's this great podcast on Mr. Rogers. And he was talking about, he was talking to somebody uh, that the host of the show was talking to, I think somebody Mr. Rogers had worked with. And, and I think it was an, another minister. I think it was a minister who came and said to Mr. Rogers that he was leaving the church that he was in, not the church itself, but that particular, you know, because the guy he worked for didn't like him, was completely mean to him, was just really doing these really super unfair things. And what Mr. Rogers said was, I wonder what happened to him when he was a little boy that made him so angry so that he couldn't really see what was going on. I wonder what happened to him. Now, he wasn't invalidating this other guy's experience. He wasn't saying, because of that, you, it should be fine that this guy treats you that way. But that's the point. When people are doing and saying things that seem so cruel or so like, how could you believe that? It always traces back to something that happened to them when they were kids, whether it's some traumatic experience or just, you know, growing up in a, you know, in a, in, in a family when we're kids and we grow up, we don't think this is how my family is, but other people are different. We think this is how people are. This is how the world is. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was once speaking at a, uh, to a writer's workshop and this one woman said, she goes, yeah, when I was a kid, she said, both my, my parents were forensic pathologists. And she said, I, I didn't go to anybody else's house for dinner till I was about eight. And when I came home, she said, I went to my parents and I was shocked. She said, mom and dad, you know, I had dinner there last night and nobody talked about dead bodies. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't just everybody's, you know, dinner table conversation. So that's often what you're up against. And that's why respecting it doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean you agree with them, but respecting it and not vilifying them for it makes such a difference. It's the only way we can ever really communicate. Cause that's sort of my goal with the, with, with the new book that I'm writing is, is besides here's how to tell stories. It's and in order to do it, to really understand the seminal and good and evolutionary role that emotion plays and will always play emotion mainlines meaning to us so that we know in a split second what to do and what things mean. It's not something to be, you know, I mean, when people go, oh, I, I'm not going to let my emotions carry me away. If I'm not going to be emotional. I'm going to be calm. And I always want to go, dude, calm is an emotion. <laughs> you are always feeling emotion. And then just to really, you know, respect the other side, even when they're 100% wrong, or at least not vilify them as, well, they're stupid or they're idiots or they're, you know, if only they knew X, Y, or Z. Because it also will stop you from going, well, they've never heard of my idea before. They've never heard of my plan before. The minute they hear of it, they'll do it. And it's like, yeah, not really. The minute they hear of it, they'll think of all the reasons why they shouldn't. So. Okay, so let's do this. What about... Um What's the best way for people to learn more about you to buy your books? Obviously, you're on Amazon and Goodreads and every imaginable Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Every, every imaginable place you can buy books. Uh huh. I have a website, which is just uh, wiredforstory.com. I also have uh, a number of uh, online um, uh, courses on both uh, creativelive.com um, and I have a, a story class on, uh, on lynda.com. And then, so you can actually, and you probably did, we talked about this earlier, but I didn't ask this specifically. Did you send me those links and the information you sent me? Because I want to put those in the show notes. I will, I will give the, I okay. will give you, I, I might not have sent you some stuff that I will. Okay. I send will. me those for sure. I'll put those in the show notes. Guys, take the class. I think I'm going to end up taking the class as well. Um, Lisa, thanks for being on the show today. This was awesome, man. This was like, I feel like I just got like a $10,000 masterclass from the master. Yay. Thank you. Yeah. It's really it's, good. Uh, uh, it was my utter pleasure. There's nothing I like more than talking story because it's talking about people and it is. the brain. What is more interesting than that? Yeah, absolutely. I enjoyed it thoroughly. So probably two, two weeks or so. I want to try to fast track this because we just finished. Well, now it's been a month or so ago we finished it, but still I want to get this out as soon as possible because it'll help people. And this will encourage them. I mean, this was a very uplifting interview sometimes people sometimes i have to drag stuff out of people and they're just not 
you know, like you said, their their level of emotional intelligence is not that good. They've got a lot of information, but they're just not really good communicating. But your authenticity and your passion and your love for what you do came out. And it. guys, if you if you're just listening to the podcast as opposed to watching it on YouTube, I want to encourage you to watch it as well. Because Lisa is a very animated person. I am as well, but I try to I try to hold myself back. You remind yeah. me a lot of my wife because she's very animated as well. And I love that's one of the things I love about her. But um, it just helps express what you're, you know, it helps get your point across, communicate much more effectively. I can't talk. I once, I'll tell you funny, quickly a funny story. When I when the first book came out and I was giving a, a you know a talk at Powell's, you know, the big bookstore in uh, in Seattle, and, and it was a big giant like room, and they said, Here, here's a mic, and they gave me this handheld mic, and I held it, and my mind went blank. Because if I can't do this, I can't talk. And luckily I have a I have a loud voice and it echoed. And I said, I have to put this down. And then it came back and I was able to do it. Yeah, I literally can't speak if I can't do this. So, so you're talking, you said pals, the, the pals that I'm familiar with, I used to live in downtown Portland is pals city of books, the four story. Yes. Pals. That is my dream location. I mean, oh, yeah. I love that bookstore guys. This is a four story covers a couple blocks. I mean, it looks, it's just huge and it's four stories tall and it's just acres and acres and acres of new and used books. I went there for the old books. Yeah. Oh yeah. And there's a sweet, sweet coffee shop on the top floor. I mean, every kind of book you can imagine. It's an experience to go there. You just don't go there for a little while. You got to go there for like, I used to live uh, probably a 10 minute walk. I lived in the Pearl district. Is that the one you're talking about? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I loved it. I loved it. I love it. It brings back a lot of memories. So anyway, Hey Lisa, thanks for being on the show. And, um, I'll get back to you real soon with the links and stuff on this. And, uh, maybe we can do it again when your new book comes out. I'd love to. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being with us today. My utter pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Our objective with this podcast is to help you and your business stand out in the marketplace by crystallizing your messaging, marketing, and communications. On behalf of the whole Ken Newhouse team, thanks for listening.